Welcome, Steve, to Wealth Matters Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. Yourself? Good. Thanks for asking and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Sure. Happy to do it. Hey, Steve, so can you tell my listeners what exactly do you do? Yeah, I, I run the uh, sales and marketing for the Fourplex Investment Group, or FIG for short. And FIG is, uh, it's a little misleading in that uh, it's not actually a company, it's just a brand. Okay. But uh, under, under that brand umbrella, there are four separate companies that are called the FIG companies. And one's a developer, a builder, a brokerage, and a property manager. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Same, same ownership across all those companies. And they all work together to produce these new construction fourplex projects in the markets that we uh, operate in. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, how did you get in real estate and how did you become like a business owner or entrepreneur? <laughs> I'm not sure. It happened, <laughs> right? Here I am. Um, I, I think for a lot of us, we fall into it and then you look back 10 years and you go, oh, I've been an entrepreneur in real estate for 10 years. What do you know? That <laughs> happened. But uh, it, it, you know, it was funny. I was, in, I was actually in college and I worked at a, at a kind of a call center slash fulfillment area for one of those oh, okay. late night real estate, real estate gurus. <laughs> okay. Oh. And uh, this was in uh, two, the early 2000s, like, oh, two, I think. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, back then it was actually a lot easier to flip properties yes. than it is now because just nobody was really doing it in right. a significant quantity. Now I get asked all the time, hey, I think I want to flip properties. Oh, um, everyone wants to be a wholesaler and flipper. and Everybody and their dog. Yeah. Same it, thing. It, they keep asking me, why don't you wholesale? Why don't you flip? I'm like, it's a transactional business. I don't want to go get into it. I know. Yeah. Uh, well, I, maybe I'm wrong. doing but... it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I wrong, but. for everybody, but <laughs> if somebody asks me that question, it means they haven't wholesale or flipped before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've, I've done plenty of it and I, I get it. it. You can make money doing it, but it's not investing. Exactly. But, it's an yeah. active business. You know, people, yeah, it is. Because the same thing they ask me, oh, should I, do I need an S Corp or LLC for wholesale and flipping? And I'm like, okay, you want, you have already done a flip and you don't even know what kind of legal structure you need, then Mm -hmm. you you are in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's, you're just buying a product for low and selling it for high, which is the, what any business does, right? And and that's not bad. You just need to know what it is, right? Too many people have the, I'm at the beach on my laptop view of what wholesaling and flipping is. Yes. (laughs) And it's not, you're at a really gross house, you know, sitting in, in dog hair, negotiating with somebody in a terrible situation exactly. um, that that's what it is and it's just there's a lot of that but yeah. there's things I really liked about it but I think we we chased a squirrel there and got off track but I I I was just in college and I worked for a company that that taught people how to do that I, I wasn't teaching them I was just the guy taking calls and shipping yeah. boxes just helping kind of on the administrative side but I was down the hall from these coaches that help people do do the real estate and I mean, this sounds pretty good. I, I maybe I'll maybe I'll do a little bit of this, and I can pay for law school because that's what I was going to do at the time. Oh, okay. Wow. And um, now here we are. <laughs> so did you ever get into law school? No, no. I, <laughs> it, in fact, when I did my first deal, my it was a, a wholesale transaction. I was sitting in college in my undergrad, and I had twelve credits left to go, and at the time. This, this was when text messaging was just barely becoming a thing. I think it was 25 cents to send or receive a text message at the time. Oh, yes. And, and a lot of times you'd send one to somebody and they didn't know what just happened. It, it was like the first time they ever got a text message. In fact, the first text message that my wife ever got was from me. <laughs> <laughs> it and, was uh, expensive. I remember that time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is when I got my phone and then it was expensive. And it, now, now it's all anybody does. You yeah. know, my kids don't even know that you talk on a phone. You, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, I, I had one of those Blackberries with the yes. kind of click wheel on the side. That's what I had at the time. And it buzzed in my pocket in this class. And it was my friend letting me know that I had just made a good chunk of money you know, for, for a college kid 
you know, a couple hundred bucks is a good chunk, but it was far yes. more than that. So <laughs> in my college eyes, I was now worth like a billion dollars and it was time to quit. <laughs> wow. And I, I left college and um, 12 years later, I actually did end up finishing the degree online, uh, but no law school for me. No, thank you. Yeah. You don't need it now. <laughs> <laughs> I then not you, you use the people that went, I need plenty, right? You always need yes. advice on legal matters, but exactly. yeah, it's not for me. But that's why you have those, you know, attorneys, right? <laughs> yeah, you need them. I just don't want to be them. Right. So uh, let me, let's get back on track as well. Cause you know, um, why you mentioned FIG is four plaques investment group. So what do you mean by that? So why four plexes? or do you only do four plexes? Well, we do a we do some duplexes and triplexes. Um, we also do some larger buildings, like we've built twelve and and twenty unit um, apartment buildings. Yeah, is is a part of our our overall fourplex project. Sometimes a city may say, "Hey, you know, we want you to go a little bit higher density over here, or do like an apartment building style," which is fine. Um, the the core of our business, though, you know, the Big Mac, right? It, it Fig is the fourplex. And it's a very specific niche because it, it kind of is where commercial investing and residential investing merge together. It's where it very first starts to begin. And at the core of it is Fannie Mae conventional financing, right? This is the, the yes. best kind of financing out there. And you know that in any real estate deal, it's just as much about the kind of financing you can get as it is the actual deal, right? Because the right. financing can make or break a deal many times. And that's why the market has been so kind to invest over the last few years because money's been cheap, right? Interest rates have been low. So the, the main crux of it is that you can get a conventional 30 year fixed loan on one to four residential Got units. Yep. So you can get it for a home, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex, but anything above four, you got to get commercial financing. And that's a whole new discussion as to how that works and, and what you're going to be able to qualify for on something like that. So the average investor, if they have a good debt to income ratio, they've got the down payment of 25% um, would really benefit from fourplexes because the key is here that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will only let you have 10 conventional 30 year fixed loans. That is correct. If, if you have 10 loans, but, but you've got $30 million in the bank, it doesn't matter. They're not nope. going to give you an 11th loan. Nope. Right. So, uh, so I'm going to interrupt here and just yeah. remind my listeners as well. So yeah, if you want to get traditional financing on an investment property, which is one through four units, you can, on your name, you can get up to 10 loans uh, and then you're maxed out. If you are, you know, filing taxes or if you're married, then you can go get 10 loans on your name plus your 10 loans on your spouse's name. But you have to plan for that situation. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to file your taxes the right way. Make sure you show enough income for both yes. of you, right? Without making one of you look broke in the eyes of an underwriter. Exactly. It's, it's a bit of a balancing act, right? So um, yeah, it, the, the whole philosophy then is that uh, nobody wins at Monopoly by buying little green houses, nope. right? Eventually you want to get into buildings. And so if you want to maximize the use of the conventional Fannie Mae financing, then the best way to do that is with fourplexes because with those 10 loan slots or 20, if your spouse is getting it, you could get in theory, 40 doors or even up to 80 doors. 80 doors yeah. That, that's crazy. If you think about it, yeah. Even if you can get to 40 doors by the time you read someone to task, that that's, that's significant because I know a lot of people who keep talking about it. They only go up to four or five properties. So that means four or five doors and they're done. So, yeah. 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 So it's, you know, it, it, fourplexes are, are funny because you, you can make a, a different play on them for, for whatever reason, builders put up a ton of fourplexes back in the seventies and eighties. And there are certain parts of town where you can go and you can find these little hodgepodge developments of those boxy looking fourplexes, right? right? two units yep. up, two units down. Exactly. They, they exist. But those, those areas tend to be pretty, uh, pretty run down now that, because... That, that is the problem. So when yeah. I'm looking, I was looking for fourplexes and triplexes and I'm like, ah, this is only either it's C 
or below neighborhoods, right? Sometimes D, and I don't want to deal with those tenants. <laughs> yeah, right. And because if the guy across the street from you gets in a bad way and he just lets whoever in and they start parking on the lawn, he lets the roof go, right? That that place looks really run down. When you need to get new tenants, they're going to look across the street at that. Yep. And they're going to go, I don't want to live here or I don't want to live here at your price. And, right. and now it's that broken window theory, right? One broken window leads a neighborhood to go just completely down, yeah. down the tubes. So on the four plexes that we're doing, we put them in HOA managed communities that we, we write the CCNRs and our investors oh, are the only okay. members. So you can't do that stuff. Now, granted, when you put an HOA on a project like this, it, it makes the project more expensive right? So yes. some people think when they're looking at a fourplex, they should have this crazy high rent to value ratio. If you do have that, it probably means you're in that C or D area C or, D, yep. or, or the fourplex just has a lot of work to do. So by the time okay. you, you put the, the money into it after the fact, your cap rate really is market, right? right. So when we do this, the, the return will look, you know, looks okay on the front end, but it's very smooth and easy to manage on the back end because you don't have to take care of the outside of it. It's not your problem. Yes, that's correct. So, so what does the HOA cover the outside? It'll cover all the exterior maintenance of your fourplex, including the roof. I was going to ask that. So the yeah. roof is included. Oh, okay. The roof is included. It also pays the master insurance policy. Okay. So, Sometimes your fourplex might be attached to another one because we build these townhouse style, right? Okay. So, uh, you, you can't risk that the guy next to you doesn't have insurance. That's why the HOA maintains right. master policy no matter what. Um, it also includes the water, sewer, and garbage for the tenants. Oh, okay. So um, that, that's significant. Yeah. That's up. Typically, the, we, we're starting to roll out a smart home package. So each door has a a doorbell cam, a Nest thermostat, a smart lock. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> nice. That's so, yeah, the cost of administering that is wrapped into the, the HOA as well. And uh, also the maintenance, the landscaping, the snow removal, taking care of the pool, the clubhouse. So, you know, you're not, the, the HOA line yeah. item would look hefty if you didn't know all those things. Right. Yeah, but yeah, if the those amenities amenities add up, right? And if if you are attracting a good crowd, good tenant base, then then you need to have those kind of amenities. Yeah, you want tenants to come, you want them to stay a while. Yes, that that's the stability. Because what you know, what I love on my on my duplexes, fourplexes, is that you know if I've got a vacancy or I had heavy repairs in one unit, I've still got other streams of income that are coming in. Right. Um, to service that. And, and right now when everything's just been peachy in the market, that might not seem <laughs> as important, but when things get a little tougher, you can't have your, your income streams too decentralized, right? You don't want them all coming in from one spot. Nope. Totally agree. Yeah. I think I got off track again. I have a tendency to do that, but no, you no, asked me a no, question. Just, this is good though. <laughs> okay. So, um, why uh, new construction? I think you kind of tell on it because, uh, but what kind of, once you do new construction, pretty much the repair and maintenance is uh, re close to zero or how does that, is that why someone would prefer new construction or is there anything else? Well, I think there's a few reasons and, and <clears throat> I, don't, I don't sit here and claim for a second that new construction is the end all be all. There are lots of great okay. investment opportunities out there. Um, probably some of the reasons why somebody would gravitate towards new construction. And I'm not speaking about just us. Well, yet, but uh, number one is, well, what's on the market that's existing. It's, it's pretty underwhelming right now. Right. What's out there. And when you're in an atmosphere where, you know, getting existing inventory is tough or what's out there is no good, but you still feel like the economy is good and you want to invest, what's your choice? Well, you got to create new inventory, right? You got to build it, which is what we do. Um, beyond that, many of the reasons on new construction, <laughs> every real estate deal, in my opinion, has a certain amount of brain damage that comes with it, <laughs> right? Or we could just call it headache that comes with it. And yeah. you have to choose, how do you want to take your headache, right? <laughs> do you want just a little bit? Do you want it spread out over time and a lot at the end? right? Yep. New, new construction, you're electing to take the majority of your headache at the beginning. 
right? Because you have to go through this process with the builder, um, all the variables that can happen with that. Um, probably the biggest headache is, is how do I know what my interest rate's going to be when this thing's actually done? That's an unknown, right? Okay. As well as your stabilization, right? You've got to go through that lease up period. And, and sometimes that happens really quick. Sometimes it takes a while. But once you're through it and you have a new construction multifamily property, you go, okay, this is the kind of stuff I could own for 30 years, right? Because you've, yeah. you've got rid of that headache on the front end. And what's, what's nice about the FIG model, I was, I was kind of speaking generally about new construction, but now specific to FIG, is our property management team is integrated into what we do. So they handle that turnover with the builder. They do all the lease up. They handle all that stuff. And even on new construction, there's going to be bugs to work out. You know, somebody moves in and is running the dishwasher and flushing the toilet, right? Your, your unit's got to get broken in a little bit. So these units have a year-long warranty with the builder. That's integrated with property management, so all the requests just go straight to them. It's oh, just okay. That's, and that's nice. The only time you hear about it is when you get your statement that, hey, there was a warranty request for a dishwasher, right? It's been fulfilled. Yeah. And so you've got that period for the tenants to break your property in while you're under warranty. It's, you're on somebody else's dime, which is nice. No, that's, that's really nice. Hey, so I'm going to change the track a little bit. I want to find out... Um, you know, uh, which markets do you operate in and why those markets? But before we discuss that, let's take a quick break. Okay. So welcome back. We are chatting with Steve from FIG. uh, And we were supposed to, or we were going to chat about the markets FIG operates in and why those markets. Can you uh, summarize for us, Steve? Well, part of my answer is going to sound really good and part of it's just going to sound like dumb luck <laughs> <laughs> on that, right? So um, the principles of FIG started this back in 2010. Now, if you remember 2010, people wanted to have you committed if you were buying real estate. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was crazy. Why would you do that? Um, it was probably about as bad as it got was in uh, 2010. So Still, there was a ton of cash on the sidelines and being located here in the Salt Lake City metro where we are, there was land at really good prices, cash on the sidelines. You know, what's, what's something we can do here to, to pull some of that cash off the sidelines and, and take advantage of a good real estate market and, uh, you know, have a hedge against downturns like this. So a nice. couple, of, couple of fourplexes got built, got sold. Hey, that sounds pretty good. Let's do it again. And of course, you know, the news for the economy in Utah and the growth has been very, very good. And I, by the way, I love Provo. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's on, it has been on fire. Salt Lake City Provo. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking to you from Provo right now. So (laughs) uh, yeah, that's where our office is. Um, And and listeners are always welcome to come and, and stop by and chat and go see some, some of the developments with us. But we, we did a couple of these and then realize, you know what, this seems to work here. We can't be the only market with a good economy, with good population growth that's landlord friendly. Where else can we go? And, and granted, there's a long list of, of places like that, but there's only so many places that we can operate in. Got it. We have to be able to hire the right people on the ground. I mean, you're opening a business. You're not just like making some calls and talking to some guys. You're, you're moving people down. You're hiring people. You're setting up shop. So the first place that we were able to do that successfully in was Houston, Texas. Okay. And that's a great market. <laughs> yeah, it's a great market. It's, yeah. It just keeps growing and growing and it's spreading out. So we, we really like Houston. We had a test project down there. <laughs> we learned a lot of lessons on the test project. <laughs> um, and, you know, we realized when you go into a new market, you do it slow <laughs> because yes. the, you just learn a whole new set of, of rules and regulations on the local level. Correct. So. We're just now finishing our, our second project, which was much bigger, 200 units in Spring, Texas. And we love that. Oh, we started. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So yeah. I lived in Houston for a year. So I know Spring area. And yeah. I worked in Provo area for three years. I used to travel. So I know Provo area as well. Really. Well, you, <laughs> you know where we, yeah, you know exactly where we're at. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then we, we've uh, been, begun taking reservations on a new project over in Cyprus, which is the city just to the west of Spring. So 
we're liking that one right now too. And then kind of as that was unfolding in Houston, we thought, where else can we operate? Where else has a good economy? Uh, it's a smaller metro, but Boise, Idaho hit our radar. Oh, Boise's on yeah. fire too, yes. It's great. I, and when people ask me, why would I invest in Boise? My answer is kind of lazy, but I say, well, you should just Google it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, you're, you're, you're going to find good stuff yeah, on, I on think the Boise metro. I think Boise was number one or number two on job growth last year. So I, I, I think per capita it was. Yeah, yes. you're, you're right. And, and all these states that we're in, Utah, Idaho, Texas, they're always jumping right. around in the top five uh, on, on most of these metrics. So we, we really like the Boise metro. We're just about to complete the first project we did up there. It's pretty big pretty big project. I think about 250 doors. And That's big. Yeah, it's big. And we just started taking reservations on another one, which we sold. And then we've got another one behind that, which is in Nampa, Idaho. Nampa is just a, a suburb of, of Boise, you know, to, it's like right. Oakland and San Francisco, right? right. They're right. next to each other. So we, we like those cities because we can operate there. Good employment growth, diverse, diverse economy, very landlord friendly areas, and and we we plan to add more markets. We've got one where we're kind of researching right now. We have some land under contract. We're very carefully going in. I don't want to give away uh, the name right away. I can give you a hint. Um, people like to go watch spring training baseball there. So <laughs> that's all I'll say for now. Yeah. No, that's a good hint. <laughs> yeah. If you can't figure that out, I can't help you. Nope. <laughs> So that that's great, uh, and I I like all three markets definitely. Of course, I'm not invested because I can't invest in every market. But I did research on all these three markets when I was planning to invest. Hey, so I I want to talk to you about because you mentioned interest rate uh, as well as the reservation. So what's the process if a newbie, a new investor? Of course, an investor who has gone through the process, they know, but. A new investor who wants to get, let's say, buy a fourplex in Houston, I mean, spring taxes, what would be the process uh, if you can summarize again? Sure. I'll just give kind of a high level process. Um, there are some specifics here that would probably put your listeners to sleep and we don't want to do that. So we'll <laughs> no, just, not yet. Well, we'll give a high level here and, and it's not uncommon to have this conversation with us three or four times before you totally get it. Um, but a, a high level, the first thing before I get into it, I, I sometimes we use the term recording the plat and investors don't know what that means. Some of them do, some of them don't. But when we record a plat, what it means is we own a big hunk of acreage and that is just okay. one piece of land, right? With one tax ID right. at the yeah. county. Yeah. When we record a plat, it means they approved us to subdivide that plat into say 30 or 40 different lots. And so now we've recorded the plat and out of that one tax ID, we've created 40 new ones. And those individual IDs are what each individual fourplex will be built on. So when you say those four, let's say 40 tax ID, you are talking about the parcels, right? APNs or whatever. That's that correct. Yeah, the APN is the... Yeah, every state refers to it a little bit differently, but yeah, the par your parcel or the APNs. Yep. Right, right, exactly. So what what will happen is... An investor will realize we're, we're taking reservations on a project and they'll reach out to us. We'll talk and we'll go back and forth, talk about their situation. Maybe they have a 1031 exchange. Maybe they have unique timing with when they can invest. And, and based on that, we'll make some recommendations on what we have available. And let's just use a hypothetical example that we have something available that starts in December of this year, right? Mm -hmm. Which means we have land under contract. We're going to close on it soon. We're going to do all the horizontal development, bring in all the utilities, and then by, by December, we have finished lots, and somebody could close on a construction loan and begin building a fourplex. Okay, that's the timing we're using in our example. Okay. So they come to us and they say, Steve, I want to reserve unit number one. And we say, great. We work on some interior upgrades, right? There are a few that make sense in a fourplex and a few that don't. And we'll get the purchase agreement sent to them. We'll get them in touch with our our lender that does the construction financing on these to get pre-qualified and they'll then they'll send in a $10,000 refundable deposit okay. to the title company in the market where the property is. 
that, and then after you've done all those things, you hurry up and wait, right? All the way until the plat records, which in this one would probably be sometime around like August or September of this year. And that this is when you go from refundable to now you owe 10% non-refundable. So I, I tell people, if you're going to wake up in a cold sweat about this, just do it before August, right? Because <laughs> in August, it's go time. I mean, you know, when you record a plat, you've, you've put a significant amount of dollars and time into that land. So you got to know people are in. So 10% do. You'll, you'll wire that to the title company. We'll remind you. We coordinate with you on that. And now you hurry up and wait some more. And once we start getting into probably early to mid-October, you're going to hear from the lender again. And they're going to line up your closing for the construction loan. And they'll, they'll update all the usual suspects like bank statements and W-2s and, and anything that has changed in your financial situation. And they'll get that final approval done for the construction loan. And when you close in December, you'll come in with another 15%. Because you already had 10% in, okay. and this is a 25% down product, okay. right? Yes. Then. Now, on top of that, you're going to have like 30 grand or more in closing costs, and that sounds really high. The reason being is that you're going to prepay a year's worth of interest on that construction loan. So the oh. bank doesn't have to chase you for it every month as the builder draws against the loan. Um, the rest of the closing costs are normal, right? Appraisal, insurance, right. lender right. points, that kind of stuff. So... Yeah, and then, then you hurry up and wait again, <laughs> right? Now it's, now it's under construction. It's typically a 10 to 12 month build time and uh, you'll just sign draws every month as the builder sends them over. If you're going to be in Boise or Utah or Texas and you want to check it out, just let us know and we can walk the site with you and show you your sticks and bricks or your concrete pad or whatever phase right. your, your fourplex is in. And uh, when it gets close to being done, the lender will get in touch and update your financials. Keep your, keep your financials clean during construction. Don't go buy a Ferrari or anything. You got to be able to qualify for a refinance. And so when, you're, when it's done, you'll refinance. And the property management team will also already be ramping up the marketing and working on your, your tenants for you. So that's just kind of a high level summary of the process. So it's, yeah, pretty much you have to be prepared, as you said, wait for waiting as well as, you know, make sure your financials are in order. Yeah, yeah. We just call that the armchair value add, right? <laughs> You're just sitting there waiting because anytime you take a piece of raw dirt and you convert it into an income producing asset, the market likes that. You, you created value. So yes. uh, I can't ever, I can't say this for sure, but it's been true in every case so far that the price that somebody pays for a fig fourplex is, is a good chunk lower than what it's ultimately worth when it's done. Okay. That, that's awesome. And Armchair course, value add. Yeah, of course. So, you know, by the time you, you know, get into the property and the construction has completed, of course, the, you know, property values have appreciated. Um, and then the construction standards you are following that would also add value to the property. That's correct. Yeah. And it's in the master plan community. So exactly. then you have investors who want to buy after the fact when these things are done and they're, they're less, they're, they're a lot more risk averse. Yeah, right. They don't want to <laughs> wait for a year and a half and, and have all these uncertain variables. They just want that asset that's making money right now. A lot of times they're doing yeah. a 1031 exchange or they just don't. Uh, want to they them. want turnkey keep asset pretty much, which is operating and it's in good shape, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Pretty much brand new. <laughs> and and Warren Buffett, I'm probably going to butcher the quote, but he said, certainty <laughs> comes at a price. Yes, right? <laughs> of course. Hey, so one more question I have is what kind of returns investors should anticipate in this markets or this kind of projects? You know, again, just a ballpark like cap rate or ROI. What have right. you seen? Um, we typically look at the IRR, but uh, your cap rate's going to be six and a half to seven on new construction. Okay. Your, your cash on cash would be like five or six. Your IRR would be in the low teens. Um, where uh, big reason I do these, you know, I like the cash flow, but they're really great for cost segregation. If oh yeah, because you, yes. you get that year one bonus depreciation. I totally forgot about that because it's new construction and everything is new. Yeah, yeah. So That's that good. that just 
all of our metrics in our pro formas can't take that into account. It's very effective for that because you, you can just get a truckload of, of depreciation in that, that first year and really front load it. So if you're tired of paying a bunch of taxes, that might be an option for you, but you know, that that's complicated based on the individual's tax return. I don't know all the details, but in right. general, yeah, it's a, it's a great property to uh, segregate like that. Yeah. And uh, you brought up a really good point because usually, you know, on a single family, the cost of getting cost segregation done isn't worth, right? But when right. you have a fourplex or, you know, two fourplexes in the same community, just getting a cost sex study is, is, usually worthwhile right again yes that is a big topic so we can discuss we are almost running out of time but i'm i promise my listeners that i'll have another uh, you know expert on cost segregation soon on the podcast and then we can go into the detail of cost seg yeah yeah it's a <laughs> it's a great vehicle you know that's taxes are the biggest expense you'll have in your entire life so yep. for me these investments are they're just as much about that as they are the the, the cash flow and, and those other metrics. So there you have it. That's awesome. Anything else uh, you or I missed? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, when, when we get into specifics on various properties and timing, of course, we would go into a lot more depth on this. This is just meant to be a high level, but right. you know, it's just a new construction fourplex. Don't overthink it. That's what it is. You know, <laughs> I don't claim that it's the only great investment out there, but I, I definitely believe it should be in somebody's portfolio. I buy them. I have one almost done with construction in Spring, Texas. I have another one reserved in, in Cyprus, and I'm, I'm circling one of our larger units here in Utah right now. Um, nice. This is in addition to what I already own. So it's, a, it's a, good, a good asset, and I plan on continuing to buy them. Yeah, and oh, that's awesome. And I'm actually going to have you back on the show when you announce the new market so that we can discuss about that market in detail. That sounds great. Yeah, I was down there a couple weeks ago checking out some various sites. So one of them actually in a federal opportunity zone. So we're Oh, nice. That's, that. that even makes it better. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. So that's awesome. Hey, um, Steve, how can, I, how can my listeners reach out to you? Sure, I'll, I'll give you two ways. Number one is just go to www.fig.us. Okay. That's our website, and you can just fill out a contact us form there. Uh, or just shoot me a call or a text. My cell number is 801-362-3392. 801-362-3392. Usually a quick text is best because I'm you know, always jabbering. On the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but uh, if you send me one, you know, we can set up a time. I'll get you some more info and, uh, you know, make sure you, you, you understand what you're getting into here, which we, we think is great, but you know, we got to go over the details. It's important to do. That's great. Thank you so much to you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Have a great weekend. Bye. You do the same. Bye-bye.